everybody, and welcome to Patient Pulse. In this episode, we will discuss the myths and realities about vitamin D in heart, lung, and related diseases. We get a lot of questions about vitamin D and its role in overall heart health and in preventing or treating blood clots. And most recently, we've received questions about whether vitamin D has any effect in COVID-19. So we're thrilled to have Dr. Clifford Rosen join us today. Dr. Rosen is the Director of Clinical and Translational Research and a Senior Scientist at Maine Medical Center's Research Institute. He is also a Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine, and he has been researching vitamin D for 25 years. So welcome, Dr. Rosen. Take it away. Thank you, Aviva, and it's great to be here. So we're going to talk about vitamin D and try to provide you with some insight into what it can and can't do. And this is an extremely controversial topic. I'm an associate editor at New England Journal of Medicine, a senior editor at eLife, and up to date is a currently most widely used knowledge base for clinicians and scientists. In the next few minutes, we'll talk about how vitamin D works, vitamin D and bone health, vitamin D and chronic diseases. I'll focus to a certain degree on thrombosis and the risks involved, particularly in ICU patients, and some of the key takeaways. Vitamin D is made in the body in a precursor form. Vitamins were generally described as being substances that you needed to have but didn't have in your body and needed to take. But vitamin D is unique in that it was discovered to actually be produced as a pro-vitamin D, as you see in the figure, in the skin. And then without any natural enzymes, but just sun exposure, the pro-vitamin D gets converted to pre-vitamin D, and that can enter the circulation, go to the liver, and get converted to active vitamin D, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and then it goes to the kidney to get to be the most active form of vitamin D, 125D. So what does vitamin D do? Vitamin D increases calcium absorption in the gut, and so any little bit of calcium you take in is 10 times greater absorbed in the presence of vitamin D. So vitamin D is essential for maintaining good calcium balance, So it's estimated that about 50 to 70% of the vitamin D present in the circulation comes from skin exposure to sunlight. The other 20 to 40% comes from the diet. You can see that the sunlight makes that pro-vitamin D into pre-vitamin D. It enters the circulation, and there it's combined with any vitamin D that you might get from your diet. If you're homebound or you have chronic illness and you don't get outside, your vitamin D levels can go down because your skin production of vitamin D is reduced. And in elderly and institutionalized individuals, vitamin D levels tend to be lower because they don't get outside. What we're all trying to do is get to normal levels of vitamin D. And the question that has been going on controversially for the last 20 years is what is that normal level? Now, in this diagram, it proposes 30 nanograms per ml to be normal in green and 10 nanograms or lower to be deficient. And then there's this insufficient level between 10 and 30. And so there's tremendous controversy because if you set the level at 30, you'll have more people that are in the insufficient deficient range than if you set it at 20, which is the range that most people now agree is a normal range from 20 on rather than from 30 on. So if you get 800 units a day in your diet, or if you take an 800 unit vitamin D or a thousand unit vitamin D, unless you have a chronic illness that can't metabolize the vitamin D, you should be able to have levels between 20 and 30 nanograms per ml. The caveat is the more your skin is darker, the lower your production of vitamin D. And this is really important for two reasons. First, it highlights how important the skin exposure is to making adequate levels of vitamin D. And two, when it comes to low vitamin D levels, 
that have been associated with risks of certain chronic diseases, the minority populations, particularly African Americans and to a lesser extent Hispanics, tend to have a greater risk. But on the other hand, particularly in the United States, the darker skinned individuals that represent the minority groups tend to have lower socioeconomic status, and that can complicate risk of chronic disease. So sorting out whether it's the lower vitamin D from less sun production in the skin versus the other elements that contribute to chronic diseases is very important, and we'll address that when we talk about COVID-19. When we think about vitamin D as a predictor of disease, I'm sure many of you have gone to your doctor and said your vitamin D level is low, you got to do this because otherwise you'll get heart disease, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Using a single blood test that really measures skin production and dietary intake as a measure of a chronic disease really represents somewhat of a leap. And sure, you need adequate vitamin D. But the question is, do low levels really mean that you're likely to get other diseases? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So we've had tons of studies looking at blood levels of vitamin D and fractures and bone density and risk of falling. And the bottom line is you should have a blood level around 20 to prevent fractures. Vitamin D supplementation does not really prevent fractures. It does not improve bone density. So the only time that vitamin D is really indicated to prevent fractures is in the elderly institutionalized individuals where vitamin D levels are going to be low. A thousand units a day is a reasonable approach for individuals that are at high risk. What about vitamin D, heart disease, and cancer? So a lot of studies that follow people for many years, what we call observational studies, have suggested that the lower your vitamin D, the greater your risk of heart disease and cancer. And they found that the individuals with lower vitamin D levels had a greater risk of both heart disease and cancer. So one of the complicating factors is those individuals that are taking vitamin D tend to be in higher socioeconomic status, and they're the ones less likely to get these chronic diseases. So a randomized clinical trial was really necessary to answer the question whether adding vitamin D might prevent heart disease or cancer. This paper, published in New England Journal, randomized 25,000 individuals to vitamin D with or without omega-3 fatty acids. And so you had at least 12,000 individuals that were getting an active form of vitamin D, 2,000 units a day, versus a group that got placebo, that is a pill which did not have any vitamin D in it. And what Joanne Manson and her colleagues showed in this diagram, to make it simple, is that there really was no difference between the group getting vitamin D and the group getting placebo for any type of cancer. So taking those 2,000 units of vitamin D for five years did not prevent you from getting cancer. And if you look at the B graph, five years of vitamin D did not prevent you from getting heart disease, stroke, heart attack, or death from heart disease. So this was very conclusive evidence, at least in the minds of most scientists, that regular treatment with vitamin D was not able to prevent the common chronic diseases that we worry about, cancer and heart disease. It turns out that obesity is associated with lower levels of vitamin D. So if you look at these graphs, both A and B, in men and women, as you move to the right and your BMI gets higher, your vitamin D levels get lower. We don't really know the reason for this. We think that it might be related to how vitamin D is distributed between fat tissue in the blood. But nobody's ever really provided a valid explanation 
And what happens about vitamin D and blood clots? Well, we have a lot of data. Much of it is not a randomized trial. So the level of evidence isn't as strong as it could be. But at least three studies have shown that normal levels of vitamin D do not predict an increased risk of thrombosis. Those individuals who have vitamin D deficiency, for example, in the range of 10 to 15 nanograms per ml, may have a slightly greater risk of venal thromboembolic disease. We don't know the mechanism for that, but we can propose that individuals that have really deficient levels of vitamin D tend to be sicker individuals. They're not the healthy people that are walking around, and they have secondary complications that might predispose them to lower vitamin D. So particularly if you've been sitting in a hospital bed for two weeks and you're being treated for cancer and you're laying around, your risk of thrombosis is higher, your protein level that binds vitamin D is reduced, your albumin and the levels of some of the major nutrients can be reduced while you're in the hospital, and that can lower your level of active vitamin D. So we recommend that anybody who's undergoing chronic diseases at least have an adequate level of vitamin D of 20 nanograms per ml, because we don't really know whether the lower levels of vitamin D in the deficient range actually might predispose for an even greater risk of blood clots. We don't think that there's a definite mechanism, but this hasn't been studied as extensively as it has for cardiovascular disease. Okay, what about COVID-19? So if you look through the literature, there are no randomized trials yet, but we have some data from the big COVID-19 centers, that is New York, Detroit, Chicago, and overseas in Europe, particularly in Italy looking at vitamin D levels as a predictor of COVID-19 severity and mortality. And here's one that we got a few weeks ago. When you look at the blood levels, those individuals that had the lowest levels of vitamin D between zero and 20 were overrepresented in terms of the incidence of COVID-19. So when they looked at patients coming in to the hospital, so they're sick already, with COVID-19, those individuals were overrepresented in that group that had the lowest vitamin D levels. So this suggested at least to some people that vitamin D could be used as a predictive value. And then you could extrapolate and say, oh, wow, those levels are low and, and those are the people going into the hospital. Therefore, we should be taking vitamin D to stay out of the hospital. Well, the issue with that is twofold. One, 70% of these patients were African-American, and two, 80% of them were overweight or obese. So those are complicating factors that drive down the vitamin D. Now, does that cause COVID-19? Well, we don't have any direct evidence that it does. We have some evidence of vitamin D can turn up, but we haven't done a randomized trial yet. There are a couple in the works, and we'll get a better idea. So one always has to worry a bit when we see data that vitamin D levels are low in individuals who have serious COVID infections because there's two major reasons why it could be obesity and dark skin since a vast majority of the sicker COVID patients are overrepresented by individuals that are dark skin. Again, I referred back to the bottom line, which is everybody should have adequate levels of vitamin D to protect themselves and levels of 20 or greater. But right now, there's no evidence that treating with vitamin D will keep you from getting COVID-19. This is a study from my colleague, Mike Hollick, in Iran, which had a very severe epidemic. And he looked at those individuals who had different blood levels of vitamin D. And what he found was those individuals that had levels less than 30 had about a 12% greater risk of dying, a 60% greater risk of having severe 
COVID-19 disease and a 30% risk of having very low oxygen. So what can we say about this study? Well, again, we don't know all the variables that have been associated with this, so we can't really say that this is direct cause and effect. But once again, the evidence suggests that there might be some relationship and that adequate vitamin D levels are going to be really important. But we do know some really important things about vitamin D. First, we know that sun exposure can prevent vitamin D deficiency. And 10 minutes a day of casual sun exposure is plenty during the summer months to prevent vitamin D deficiency. Now in the winter, in northern latitudes, it's unlikely that the sun is high enough in the sky to really generate enough vitamin D. So in that situation, we generally recommend that vitamin D be given through a supplement. And particularly if there's concern about sunburns or skin cancer, that vitamin D can be adequately replaced in the diet. So how do we do that? This is work from a couple of different groups that show that when you add vitamin D in your diet through a supplement, you increase your blood levels of 25 vitamin D, and that's what you want to do. But basically, it plateaus at 800 or so units per day. So you only need 800 units a day to really get adequate vitamin D in the winter months. What's wrong with taking more vitamin D? Well, the answer is increasing your dose of vitamin D doesn't raise your level much more, particularly if you start off in the normal range. But there's also some evidence that it could be harmful. One lesson we've learned is no vitamin D is a problem. Some vitamin D is good for you. Too much vitamin D is bad for you. And we've gotten away from giving mega doses of vitamin D. It's not safe at very, very high doses, particularly in elderly individuals. So I hope I've given you a summary of what I think the state of the art is in vitamin D. And as you can probably glean from my lecture, we have a lot of unanswered questions. With that, I'm going to just remind you of the key takeaways. Vitamin D is made in the skin. It's 100% absorbed, so if you take a supplement, it'll all be absorbed. You don't have to take high doses to get absorption. Vitamin D promotes calcium absorption in the gut, so calcium is really important for your body. Vitamin D levels are generally healthy between the levels of, we'd say 50 to 20 to 45 nanograms per ml. They're going to be lower in people who are African-American or Hispanic, and they're going to be low if there's chronic illness. But there's very little evidence that vitamin D levels help the physician predict any kind of chronic disease. And the U.S. Public Health Service Task Force has recommended against doing screening for vitamin D to predict chronic diseases. Vitamin D treatment has yet to have been shown to significantly reduce the impact of acute or chronic diseases. And the jury's still out on COVID-19, but right now we're not recommending supplementation with vitamin D to prevent infection with COVID-19. That wearing masks and social distance is a much better prophylaxis. And I would argue that 800 units of vitamin D is sufficient for most individuals. So thank you very much. I hope I've answered most of the questions that you might have. I hope that this spurs you to be thinking about vitamin D anyways in your day-to-day -day life. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen. That was a wonderful overview. We're very grateful to have you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And feel free to join us next month for another episode of Patient Pulse.